Okay, so uh, this is the first uh, of a tentative multi-part series um, that I want to kind of conduct. Um, the idea behind this is that I realized that it was a long time during when I was debating, um, when I was plateauing a good bit around a particular level, um, oftentimes in and around the break, maybe missing the break on speak, so landing on minus one, or maybe breaking and getting past the first around, but not the second. Um, and I realized that there is a specific difficulty in advancing past that particular point in debating, because it's reliant on access to certain resources that aren't universally distributed. So for me, I was very fortunate that I made a lot of friends during that time um, who were very useful in providing me information and ideas and strategies and um, I guess tips and tricks I, in, in a basic way um, to help me advance past that period. I was fortunate that I was also able to do a lot of work during that period because I was able to, you know, the jobs I was working um, let me debate on the weekends. So I was able to do a lot of competitions and um, my college work wasn't too significant. So I was able to uh, watch a lot of debates and uh, learn from them. Uh, but I recognized that I was quite fortunate to have that available to me. And I feel that there is only a very few amount or there's very few kinds of people that are able to get that kind of information because um, it requires not just going to, you know, a society that has a good trainer, um, but also like to have everyone else in your society be around that level um, so that everyone is advancing together. And, you know, I thought that this information might be valuable for those kinds of groups. Um, advanced here is in inverted commas because it's not extremely advanced. Um, I don't profess to be, you know, one of the great debaters or anything like that. Um, I've done decently enough. Um, what I more so mean is that this is beyond the basics. So it presumes that you have some level of familiarity with you know, debating in general, the meta, so to speak, um, that in any given debate, you're familiar with what the expected arguments are going to be. Um, and you know a bunch of different arguments that you could run, and it's about how to choose those very well and to, to get the most out of them. It's basically for around people that are like finishing on you know, minus two, minus one, straights, plus one, uh, and not very much higher or lower. Um, if you do find yourself finishing lower or higher than that, maybe you will find some things that could be valuable here. Um, but it's ideally meant to be for around that kind of level uh, of debate. And this one I want to focus on here is strategy uh, for this, I guess, session. Although um, if there's interest, I, I, I think I would also like to do one, for example, on principles at like a quite advanced level uh, workshop on principles and impacting and weighing and some other things that um, I have, I think some information that might be useful for some people on that I haven't seen discussed very frequently so far. So let's get into that. Uh, the first thing to talk about is the difference between strategy and tactics. So whatever way you conceptualize this difference doesn't matter too much, but in general, it's just that strategy is your general approach. Uh, to maximizing the points returned from a competition. How do I get the most out of this competition as possible? Um, or out of this prep season as possible? Or out of this you know, major as possible? It's a general approach, whereas tactic, tactics is more specific, right? It's in a particular round uh, against particular teams in a particular motion, um, you know, at a particular point in the competition. How should I tailor my strategy to fit this objective? So a good analogy for this would be if you're familiar with football, um, you know, a strategy would be like your formation, like 4 3 3 or 4 4 2 or whatever. Um, and in the same way that like 4 3 3 was developed because it has a comparative advantage over 4 4 2 to stack the midfield, um, your strategy should be developed to beat the other general strategies that exist. Whereas tactics would be, you know, your individual player directions within a particular round. So getting like Jason Park to mark Lionel Messi as he should have done in the Champions League final would be like a tactic. Um, I know that's not intuitive for people that don't know football, but you know that kind of thing, right? It's the kind of general vision versus the specific directive um, and the specific modulation of your strategy to fit a particular round. And regardless of whether or not you um, think of it in these specific terms, it is useful to distinguish between your general approach and your specific approach um, in terms of 
isolating a good strategy because you want to do different things for, for them both, as we'll explain. So the structure of this um, workshop is going to be firstly talking about strategy and how to develop a strategy, what strategy is, et cetera. Then talking about tactics and similar things there, how to develop them, uh, what they look like. And then I want to talk through a specific debate and how strategy and tactics played into that debate. Um, because I understand that a lot of people don't really talk about strategy or tactics. It tends to be this kind of behind closed doors, black box vision, right? Where different teams have their own internal strategies and tactics. And we only see the end product normally. We see them debating in a particular round. Uh, so I, I want to do is kind of um, demysticize that a little bit um, through a particular round uh, at the end. And hopefully you'll see by that point um, how the different teams arrived at doing what they did in that round. So moving on then, uh, what is strategy? Basically, you want to identify the strengths and weaknesses of the pool. So the pool being just the other debaters that exist based off the objective you have for your strategy. So that can be people within your circuit or at the particular competition you're preparing for or within your bracket. So the teams that you generally hit pretty frequently at the competition. And in general, it's best to focus on the teams on the like innermost layer. So if you think about it as like layers outwards, the innermost layer of the pools, the teams you hit most frequently, um, teams you tend to see pretty often, developing a strategy around that can be pretty useful. You could also, depending on what you need, uh, focus a strategy on beating teams just above your level. So for example, if you frequently beat teams at a particular level, but then almost always lose the next round when you kind of go up to the next bracket and are hitting teams that are slightly better, you might want to develop a strategy to beat those teams if you're already comfortable with beating teams around your level. Because that's something that um, me and Jack went through for a while where we'd like we'd win minus one rooms and then immediately lose straight, straight rooms. Or then later we would win straight rooms and then immediately lose the minus one rooms. And so we were kind of zigzagging through the brackets of our competition. What can be useful then is if you're pretty confident in a particular level, but really not doing well at the next level up, developing a strategy to deal with that. But it's also useful to you know maintain strategies for people that are slightly lower than you uh, who might have a strategy developed to try and beat you because they probably are thinking the same thing. Oh, well, we need to be able to beat X team when we hit them, and if you don't have a counter strategy against them, you can be caught out. So it's useful to think about things around your level um, and that kind of thing. Counterintuitively, this actually tends to be easier for teams that are much better because at the higher end of a competition, there's far fewer teams. There's far fewer teams that like um, get to the top rooms of every competition than get to the straights rooms. So it's actually much easier at a higher level because there's fewer um, variables, right? There's fewer different teams that you there's less teams in general that you can um, meet. Um, but also, I'm sure that you know, at any given level, there's probably five or six teams that you find yourself hitting pretty frequently, or a general vibe that you get of teams that are in different competition. And the way in which you would do this um, is that you would just look at what's working well and what's working poorly for other teams, writing things down during OAs, looking for similarities, talking to your partner after a competition. What do we notice teams doing? What do we notice teams not doing? And then the other thing you want to do is identify your strengths and weaknesses relative to that pool. So not just what you're good at abstractly, but what you're good at specifically in relation to uh, or in comparison to other teams around you. So what is it that you're doing well? When are you winning rounds? What rounds are you winning? And what rounds are you losing? And why is it that you're winning or losing those rounds? Are there similarities between the reasons for both of those things? That should give you a strong sense of what you can do well or what you are not doing so well. Similarly, will also involve things like, well, who am I outside of debate, right? Um, so for example, um, I tend to do pretty well in art motions uh, because I'm really interested in art. I consume a lot of content about it. I read a lot about it and that kind of thing. But I do really poorly at economics because um, I don't enjoy it very much. I don't find it very interesting. And it's also something that I'm just not very good at doing, right? I'm not very, um, my brain isn't very well suited to that kind of thinking. Um, meaning that I know even outside of debating, that these are the things that I can bring in as strengths or weaknesses into my debating environment. Obviously, in general, you want to still work on improving your weaknesses um, because that will give you more options in terms of your strategy. Um, but also, it's not just the only thing you should do that you should improve your weaknesses. It should be also that you focus on ways to minimize it. So with this in mind, straightforwardly, the goal of a strategy is to minimize the presence of the strengths of other teams um, 
and to minimize your weaknesses while maximizing the presence of their weaknesses and your strengths. Because the more time they spend debating things that you're good at doing, the less likely it is that they'll win. And the less relevant the time they spend when they're debating stuff that they like doing, the less likely they will be to win. So, you know, if I'm in a motion um, with three other teams and every team is talking about principles, I'm more likely to do well because I'm a philosophy student. But if we're in a motion where all four teams are talking about economics, I'm likely to do much worse because I'm not as good at doing that. So putting the debate on your terms and trying to find ways of doing that is the ultimate goal of a general strategy. So that's kind of fairly straightforward. And I think that people mostly are familiar with that theoretically. I think it's the next couple of steps that become pretty difficult. So uh, how do you formulate a strategy? So um, apart from the stuff we just said there, when you've identified the strengths and weaknesses of the pool and of your own self and your team, uh, an example of, I'm going to give two examples of this because um, it's easier to explain in specific than in general. So if you're preparing for a competition where you've noticed the first speakers of each team is stronger than the second speakers, um, you know that there's likely going to be weaknesses in weighing, rebuttal, and rebuilding, because those are the kinds of things that second speakers tend to do more and first speakers tend to do less. And even if first speakers that are at the competition are good at doing those things, they're likely to spend less time on it. So you're going to identify a weakness there. One way of working this in with your strategy is to focus on large quantities of framing with a lot of rebuttal, because framing makes arguments irrelevant. So if you frame out an argument, it means that that argument is unlikely to um, you know, uh, achieve its ends in that round. Because it doesn't just say the arguments are untrue, it just says, well, we don't care if they're true. It's not what this motion is about. And that's the kind of thing that a second speaker oftentimes will do a lot of in response and that kind of thing. And if you do that with a large quantity of that alongside rebuttal, because the first speaker can't spend too much time on weighing and rebuilding of their arguments, um, well, obviously they can't rebuild their arguments, uh, but even preemptively rebuilding their arguments, um, which I suppose is just building their arguments. But even then, they can't spend too much time doing that because they need to spend time proving their points, which means that you're pushing the focus of the pressure on that team towards the second speaker. So you're basically overpowering them. If you have a, give them a lot of stuff to do, you're going to beat them, even if you're not, you know, in theory, as good as that team. Because that second speaker needs to not just beat you, who has given 15 points of rebuttal and five pieces of framing against their argument, but also the other two teams in the debate as well. So you're likely going to be able to overpower them on the quantity of analysis that you're giving against them. This depends on the specifics, though, obviously. So, for example, if you notice that the first speakers um, that are competing at the competition are actually really good at framing. So for example, um, uh, like someone like Sophia A, right? Uh, Rumi and Nikki, where uh, both of them are really good at framing. You might want to take a different approach, right? You could focus on principles um, because that would allow you to beat arguments that um, are well, very well proven by the first speakers uh, on, a, on a comparison of weighing, right? You can weigh out their arguments based on running lots of principles and you can run really complex ones that are really difficult to rebut. So you can still make the second speaker struggle a little bit more. Um, or you can do um, a lot of high quality framing so that even if they're good at framing in general, you push back, back, push back against their skill by attacking it along the lens of quality rather than quantity. Again, none of this is specifically important, but this is just a way of thinking about it. Another example of this is if you notice that there's a lot of competition at a tournament that speaks quickly and covers lots of material, um, you know that there's likely going to be weaknesses at the depth of analysis and weighing because running a lot of arguments comes at the expense of explaining each thing in detail and weighing each of those claims as fully as they can. Because uh, obviously it's just like, that's a strategy in itself. Covering a lot of ground is, is a way of, for example, making it difficult to extend on you or giving you too much to do so you can't respond to all of it. Um, so that's one particular strategy that other teams can be using very frequently. And it's useful to think of, well, how can I counteract that? That's a very common strategy. Uh, likely, the weakness there is going to be, as I said, depth of analysis and weighing. So you might want to develop a strategy that involves running less material, because there will be less material available for you to run in extension, for example. Um, or if you run, no matter how much material you try to run at opening, your closing will always be able to find more. So the quantity of analysis won't be able to win you the round. Um, but rather, strong material that's well explained, that's impacted and weighed well, because if you're not going to be as analytically strong, analytically strong in the sense of writing a lot of uh, mechanization, you can weigh out other things because other teams are less strong at doing that. They do it less frequently. 
they're not going to do it preemptively as much. So if you're in bad calf, you can have a field day. And even if they're trying to responsively weigh and frame, uh, or sorry, weigh and impact, uh, they're going to be less familiar with that. Uh, and so they're going to be weaker at it. Uh, this means also similarly, it's rarely effective to blanketly adopt strategies of the top, st of top teams uh, without critically analyzing whether that strategy would be good for you. you know, for example, if me and Jack uh, were developing a strategy to beat Matt and Appa at LSEA, um, it would have been a terrible idea for us to go, okay, well, let's try to still just do what they're doing against them because they've done it longer and they're doing it because they're good at doing it. Whereas we're doing our thing because we're good at doing our thing. So we would have just lost every single time we hit them if we tried to just do what they were doing. And that's true at all levels uh, of debate. It's very rarely a good idea to just do whatever you see the top teams doing. Um, not only because there's a lot of variety within top teams and they'll do a lot of different strategies, uh, but also because it's important to see well, which of those things will work for you. And you can be syncretic, right? Take bits and pieces from different teams uh, to formulate a strategy that involves your strengths, minimizing your weaknesses, basically. So uh, with that in mind then, that's the idea of like how you would go about identifying what strategy you want to develop because you've found the strengths and weaknesses of your team and of the other teams. You figured out how you can interact those strengths and weaknesses with one another. Now, how do you develop that? Well, generally speaking and kind of straightforwardly, it means practicing, practicing a particular style and becoming familiar with it. Um, you know, just doing a lot of that thing uh, so that you become better at doing that thing. But it can also involve some more specific things. Basically what I mean there, uh, and we'll take an example here of a strategy that you've decided you want to focus on weighing because you've realized that the other teams are not doing very much weighing and you're good at doing weighing. So you're going to do a strategy focused on weighing. One thing you want to do then is think of common scenarios in which you could be doing weighing and practice being effective and creative in those environments. What might this look like? Well, uh, for example, this means that you should be prepared to have a way of weighing an extension against teams that turf burn, right? Teams that run a lot of material. So you have a way of dealing with questions like, you know, well, how can I get the judges to believe that our three mechs um, were better than openings five mechs for the same point? That could be things like weighing of level of proof and detail. An example of this would be um, three ways, basically. You can blow pitfalls in your openings argument um, via the implicit or implicit or implicit or explicit rebuttal of other teams. So like opening government said X, but opening opposition said Y, uh, which disputes X. So when we said Z, that was the most important contribution. Uh, it can also be done by weighing your individual mechanisms as occurring in more cases um, or to a greater degree. So opening government said X, um, but that only applies to this subset of cases, whereas our claim Y applies to this larger set of cases. Or it can also be done by uh, claiming why your mechanisms apply to more relevant or important groups. Um, so their mechanisms imply that the middle class um, become, you know, get more employment, but they're likely insulated against the harms of unemployment. But we explain why the working class become more employed and they're not as insulated against the harms. Uh, so basically just like vulnerability weighing, but not for the case itself but for the individual mechanisms within the case. So if you're doing an analytical extension of getting familiar with weighing specific implications of mechanisms can be a way of dealing with turf burning teams. Because if you're in an environment where weighing um, is your strategy, that likely means that you need to find out a way to weigh against teams who are, who are developing a strategy focused on running a large amount of material or burning a lot of uh, matter. Uh, meaning that you need to have a strategy to like ready to go to deal with this kind of thing. Similarly, it also means that you need a default way of weighing extensions where you're like reliant on one line of analysis from your opening, but you expand the detail of it. Um, three ways in which you can do this, for example, is um, making their contribution irrelevant or like unimportant. So uh, basically implying that the other teams agree with what they're saying. So they said, um, you know, claim X. But if you look at opening opposition's material, they already agree with X. Look at what they're arguing. Uh, so that doesn't actually bring the claim of opening government forward here. The more, in question, the more important question was uh, thing Z, which we answered in our case. So what you're doing there is you're making yourself no longer reliant on that claim. Uh, secondly, it can be done by explicitly stating the extent of their analysis implications. So making the argument become pre-argumentative, making it not actually reaching its full extent, and explaining the shortcomings of it, and explain how you expand the scope of it. Or you can do it by weighing via framing, right? So frame out the relevance of their contribution, which is the same thing as the first thing, um, but it doesn't rely on your opposition being competent. Um, you can just do that by basically being, it's not quite knifing, but it's framing out the relevance of the part of the analysis that they did uh, and framing in the relevance of your analysis. So um, 
that's three ways in which you go about doing that. Now, none of this is, I guess, um, sacrosanct, and a lot of this will work differently for different people. But the idea of what I'm saying here is going through the levels of detail, right? So you start off, I need to develop strategy. Okay, look at strengths and weaknesses of the pool and of our team. Look at how those things interact. What will I need to do? What will be an effective strategy in that environment based off those strengths and weaknesses? Well, okay, effective strategy will be this thing here. What will this thing need to be able to do in order to beat those other things within that strategy? Well, it needs to do these common things. Uh, and therefore, uh, here's the kinds of common things that I need to practice in order to win a round based off this strategy. Um, so basically, um, you're trying to identify common difficulties or scenarios that you would find yourself in with a particular round and becoming familiar with the ways in which you can navigate those difficult scenarios. There's two reasons why this is beneficial. Firstly, it means you're not going to be stuck. Um, it means that you're not going to end up in those scenarios where like immediately after the round, you realize what your response should have been or how you should have weighed or you get feedback by the judge and you're like, yeah, <clears throat> I realized that that would have been a good idea um, and kind of not be late to the, like, late to the game in that sense. Uh, but it also means that even if you would have eventually come up with those ideas, it means that the, the mental load is decreased. You don't have to spend as much time um, coming up with those things on the fly uh, because you're already practiced and familiar with how to do those things. Meaning that you can spend more of your time in the round thinking and dealing with other problems that are more specific to that round, like the tactics stuff that we'll get to later. Um, so the new things that you didn't predict or could not have foreseen you can deal with them more effectively because you're spending less time dealing with things that could have been dealt with before the round ever began, before the tournament ever began. So that's the idea behind uh, strategy. We get on to uh, two more things to do with strategy before we get onto tactics. Uh, the first thing is about uh, game theory. I'm going to be, I guess, a little bit brief here, but um, there's a couple of things to this. Basically, um, not everyone in a debate has perfect ability to play every strategy. So for example, if there was, you know, in every debate, there's theoretically the best possible arguments, right? Um, and uh, the ones that are the easiest to prove, hardest to disprove, have the biggest impacts, take the least time to explain, are the best arguments. Um, and in if every team was perfect, um, no team would ever deviate from these things. But this is only the case in theory, because most debaters are familiar with the most common arguments, which means that they're very familiar with the most common responses to those arguments. So those arguments are not as strong as they are in theory because debaters are really good at responding to those common arguments. However, they're oftentimes going to be less familiar and less strong at responding to the second, third, or fourth best arguments in a round, uh, the unintuitive ones, the creative ones, uh, the ones that involve ingenuity. Uh, and so they're less likely to be able to preempt those arguments or to respond to them where they are present. This is the way um, cases that you don't see as often. So principal cases, feminist cases, sociological cases, etc., can oftentimes be extremely effective if the pool is not familiar with or doesn't frequently run those arguments. So oftentimes counterintuitive uh, or inventive arguments can be stronger than they would first appear uh, because other teams don't know how to respond to them. So this is basically um, why it can oftentimes be really valuable to, to be doing something that's a bit different from the rest of the teams uh, within that bracket. So your focus shouldn't just be on running the best possible cases or your best possible strategy in general, but the best strategy and cases based off of how good other teams are responding to them. So the kind of second order of thinking of strategy, you know, not just, okay. So say, for example, you, you've realized that there's uh, the pool is, is um, weak, to, or say you're, you realize you're, you're strong at weighing, uh, impacting, and framing, uh, but you realize that people are good at responding to impacting and framing, you might want to develop a strategy focused around weighing, which people are worse at responding to. Or you might want to develop a strategy around running things that you're good at doing. So maybe you're really good at running really human level analysis uh, on how people interact with things on the ground. Or maybe you're really good at running psychological analysis uh, because you study that in college and you can run it well in debates. Um, developing strategies about using those things well, so that's like a matter-based strategy, uh, can be valuable in terms of the returns you can get on it. However, the next slide is, is a caveat to this, which is that um, that only makes perfect sense in an objective game, right? So in like chess or esports, uh, if you run an off-meta strategy, um, 
its efficacy is just decided based off of objectively how that round plays out or how that game plays out. Uh, but debating is subjective because um, it's done by judges that are trying to be objective in line with the manual, but are ultimately humans, which means that off meta, unfamiliar, or unusual arguments are often not as effective as they might theoretically be because judges are less familiar with these kinds of arguments. So if you are going to incorporate a strategy that involves these categories of arguments, um, you also want to prepare ways of making these arguments intuitive, accessible, and intelligible within the language of the meta. So for example, that can be thinking of really good intuition pumps for the cases that you're going to run and being familiar with those. It can be good thinking of really good examples or clever wording or intuitive wording of, of different kinds of ideas to make these things more intelligible and intuitive to make it easier for a judge to give you the first of them. That's something that me and Jack uh, tried and failed to do, to do with principles. Um, because we were never really able to get out of our head with them. Um, but that's something that we tried to do. Um, and it's a good idea for you to do in general, if it's the kind of analysis that suits you as a team. And I think most teams will have something that falls within this category. So I think most teams have at least one or two things that they have a specific level of knowledge on or a specific level of talent um, uh, with regards to that they can accentuate and make as good as possible um, by couching it in accessible language for the average judge, um, because other teams won't be able to respond to it, but the judge will be able to pick up on it and then you're fine. Cool. So just to recap on strategy, before we move on to tactics, we said five things. Firstly, strategy is a general approach to debating the pool. It focuses on neutralizing others' strengths while accentuating, accent, accentuating yours. And involves preparation of techniques to do this. Uh, all of meta strategy is counterintuitively oftentimes valuable, uh, viable, and its viability is tempered by the subjectivity of the game. So you need to interact with that subjectivity if you're doing any off-meta strategies. That's the kind of main thesis of the strategy section. Bringing it on to tactics now, uh, which I think is where some of the more interesting stuff comes in, in my opinion. So tactics are the individual steps you do uh, specific to the round that you're in to achieve your objective in the round. And normally there's two kinds of objectives that you might want to have for a round. First would be maximizing the expected points return of the round. So getting the most amount of possible points in the round. Um, and noting that you need over a competition, on average, two of them to break. Um, might need slightly more in some competitions or slightly less in others. You also, depending on the round, might need to minimize the risk associated with that. So maximizing points for turn while minimizing risk. It's kind of basic objective of strategies, but also tactics. Because in tactics, these things become more fluid because your, your objective is more particular to the round at hand. So they're variable to your specific situation in the competition. Example of this is if you're in like round nine of a major and the back tab says that you're on straights with plus one, well, firstly, don't listen to back tabs, but say, for example, you just know that this one is true. Um, the difference between coming fourth and third is infinite because fourth means you don't break and third means you do break. Uh, but between coming third and second and third and first is basically nothing. You'll break higher or lower, um, but the difference between coming third and second is so much larger, or sorry, so much smaller than coming fourth and third. Um, that it means that your priority and your strategy needs to be focusing on minimizing the risk of return of points rather than getting the most amount of points. So you might want to adjust those tactics in that way. An example of this might be if you're in closing opposition, focusing heavily on rebutting and doing responsive material while running a really intuitive and reasonable case. Um, Cause that maximizes your chances of being at least two teams in the round, uh, even if it means you're less likely to beat your own opening. Um, this is true. For example, even if there's like a really good principle that you could have that might win the round, you know, a lot of the time. So even if the, there's that one case, that one idea that might take a first 75% of the time, uh, but take a fourth 25% of the time, uh, that's a 25% chance of not breaking. Whereas a less radical case uh, might take a first never, uh, but take a second half of the time, a third 40% of the time, and a fourth 10% of the time, which is less expected points return. You're not going to get as many points in that case. Um, but it's far less likely to leave you not breaking, or 15% less likely to leave you not breaking. So it's oftentimes a better strategy to do um, a more intuitive, reasonable case uh, and a more responsive case, focusing on rebuttal in these kinds of environments. Uh, contrastingly, if you're on minus two, you'll need to take a first. So the opposite happens. You should run that crazy principle. Um, well, you don't actually, you should never run the crazy principle, uh, but you might want to run a tactic that involves more risk. So for example, spending more time responding to the team that you think is taking it first, rather than leaving them alone to focus on the other two teams. Uh, and if you're on minus three, you'll likely need good speaks at best. So you want to win in a large margin as well. 
you want to win in a way where it's obvious that you won this debate and you won the debate in the next room and you won the debate in the room across there. Uh, so building in like that vertical redundancy, loads of different ways of winning the debate. Um, maybe even some rhetorical flair, playing up whatever the judge likes, that kind of thing, um, will be useful for you because you'll need, you'll need to get high speeds to break. Um, but also, if you think your speeds are already really good because you did well in other rounds in good rooms, then you might not want to do that. You might want to focus on just winning the debate at hand. Again, it's all dependent on your context, but these are the kinds of conversations that you need to be having when the draw comes out um, or before the round. Because if you the draw comes up, you see the three teams that you're with, um, you'll probably have a sense of uh, what points that room is on and um, what you need from that room to advance or to break or to whatever. Um, so this is the kind of thing that you want to be talking about during that time between the draw coming out or even just before the draw coming out and the motion coming out. Because you know it's even though sometimes it's a good idea to spend that time dancing to the motion song, oftentimes you want to have a good idea of what you want to do. And that's something you should be talking with your partner about. Uh, so basically tactics can also involve a fair appraisal of your likelihood of beating the other three teams. So remember, each team you beat is worth one point, regardless of what team that is. So oftentimes you get the most amount of points by focusing on the teams that are worse rather than the teams that are better. Because if you spend six minutes rebutting at opening opposition and still lose to them, uh, you've also only spent one minute rebutting closing opposition or weighing as opening government. So you're more likely to lose to those two. Whereas if you spend three minutes on CO, three minutes on OG, and one minute on OO, um, if OO presumably are the best team in that room, um, you're far more likely to just take a second um, in that example. So oftentimes this means what you want to do in a particular round if one team is really strong and your chances of them of beating them are not very high and you don't need to get three points from that round. Oftentimes you might want to just give like some simple weighing against that team for like a minute and then focus more on beating the other two teams and making sure you get that second. Um, so I, I think this is mostly things that people might be already pretty familiar with. But again, I think the most important thing from this is just doing these things when you know that you should be doing them is actually one of the most important things because it's easy to know abstractly that um, I need to take a second in this room. But it's about making sure that when you're writing your case, when you're in the round, and when you're actually doing the debate, that you're remembering to keep this stuff in mind when you're going into it. Okay, going on to some team-specific tactics now. Um, so basically you want to interact with the specific teams based off of the motion and that kind of thing. And I'm gonna give an example of just three teams that, that I used to uh, hit quite frequently um, who uh, with Jack Palmer when we debated as Phil A, um, who sometimes we would beat them, sometimes they would beat us. I think these three teams probably beat us more often than we beat them. Um, but we did develop strategies that worked sometimes, or tactics um, that worked against them sometimes. So we'll explain what those tactics were and how they worked and that kind of thing. So you get an idea of how you can modulate your tactics or your strategy to fit a certain round. So the first one would be uh, Sophia, right? Ruben and Nikki or Ruben and Alec. Um, if they were in closing government and we were in opening opposition, uh, we did win one round from this position uh, before um, by doing this tactic at some in round of some competition um, where I remember it worked out really well because um, our strategy then involved lots of framing. Um, at one point, I think it was like uh, Ruman responded to us being like, guys, it can't just be true in every frame. And we POI them being like, it is. Um, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Basically, they're really, really strong at framing and out framing items. It's the best in the world at it. Uh, but Bulgaria in general is really, really good at this. Um, and delivering really strong responses to weak arguments. They're really good at like swatting away the flies. They're really good at just like knocking out weak arguments in the round or unintuitive or poorly explained or poorly analyzed arguments. So the tactic that we developed for that position would have been to either run arguments which can operate in any frame, so framing proof arguments, or heavily frame things in really reasonable ways. So take the reasonable frame of the debate, justify the hell out of that, um, even when it might seem like obvious, right? So a lot of times you won't run framing when you think the framing is obvious. But in this example, it's important because you think that they might outframe you uh, alongside running higher quality, deep analysis rather than a lot of analysis because um, they're very good at responding to weak arguments. Um, so you need to increase the strength of your arguments, the depth of each explanation, you know, not just having, not having five mechanisms, but having three explained in more detail, that kind of thing, uh, running two points instead of three or one point instead of two. Um, so that you can give it that little bit of depth and that extra framing at the expense of running maybe 
a more impactful argument or uh, more arguments uh, and that kind of thing. So that's one strategy or tactic. Again, I keep getting the two of them um, mixed up, but that's one tactic that we employed in that scenario. A second example would be Miguel A, so like Naomi and Max, if they were in CG and we were in LG, so if they're exciting up. Um, this was like the nightmare scenario um, for me and Jack in like prep season for tournaments because it's it's very difficult to beat those guys from opening if they're extending off you because they're just really, really good at extending. And the reason for that was because they had this unique balance of strong, clever mechanization, like reasonable mechanization, um, but also being able to do a lot of it and go very wide with their case as well. Um, so you couldn't weigh on your strength of analysis because they'd have stronger analysis and you couldn't weigh on um, like uh, the like, yeah, so you basically couldn't do that. Uh, and you also couldn't turf burn them because they'd find more analysis. Um, so the strategy we developed was to weigh our mechanism, mechanisms on sufficiency. Just be like, these three arguments sufficiently prove this point. So I'm now going to weigh the hell out of this point and impact the hell out of this point. Because that way, even if they do more analytical extension on it, uh, unless they weigh the, 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 me the individual mechanisms, um, they won't beat us. And if they bring in a new extension, it won't beat us. Um, unless they do a load of weighing. So we're pushing them onto the back foot because they were better at mechanization than they were at weighing. So forcing them to do more weighing um, was the ideal strategy for us. Now, from this position, they would still mostly beat us, um, but this worked a couple of times. Um, and those couple of times were times that we got points in rounds that we wouldn't have gotten otherwise um, based off of tactics developed to fit the specific scenario of that round. Third example uh, is LSEA. So we hit LSEA a lot. Um, and actually, I think we probably hit, were pretty even over the, the course of, of, of Worlds and Euros um, and Worlds again <laughs> when we hit them like four or five times uh, in like each in rounds um, or out rounds. Um, so we, we, became, we got very detailed on the strategies or tactics we developed to beat them. So generally, uh, they overpower teams with lots of analysis that's hard to disprove. Uh, and analysis being hard to disprove and being really strong are not actually necessarily the same thing. And I think they oftentimes focused on making analysis that would have taken a lot of time to respond to, a lot of time to rebut, um, rather than analysis that was abstractly strong. So it was strong in the context of the round because it would beat other teams that couldn't spend all their time responding to it. We often noticed two weaknesses in there as a team. Firstly, they oftentimes deferred to like home economic argumentation. So they would basically think that actors interacted rationally with incentives or think very individually you know there's, there is x incentive which brings y response even if that's not directly rational uh, and secondly uh, when they were kind of up against it they would oftentimes retreat to two specific arguments firstly access to identity so this will allow people access to their own identity and they'd weigh the shit out of that um, or a race to the median argument so this competition creates a race to the median which is good for xyz reason um, so our tactic against them in a particular round would be to run creative um, kind of sociological analysis, some more group identity type things or more kind of um, abstract stuff um, that could tackle multiple arguments at once because oftentimes you would find um, you know, a number of different underlying premises that presumed rationality of actors that if you challenged, you could kind of put them on the back foot. So that would retreat, make them retreat to like identity or median-based analysis. Um, and we'd have material prepared to defeat that analysis in weighing later on in a deputy speech. Um, this is kind of broadly the strategy that we used to beat them in uh, the art motion at Euros, um, which uh, was a lot of fun. We really enjoyed that round. And then the two rounds later, um, we got convincingly beaten by them because they out-tacticked us in, in a motion about journalism that they were much better at us at. Um, so obviously, motion-dependent tactics work in specific ways. Um, but there was a really interesting and really fun tactical battle over a lot of different rounds over the course of like two prep seasons uh, between us and LCA, where you can see here that the things actually develop quite deep over time, as long as you're constantly thinking and updating on how these things work. So if you get what I mean, this kind of stuff here is far more specific and relative to the debate than the overall strategy that you want to employ um, over the course of a competition or a prep season. It's far more contextual than the general strategy that you'd be employing. It's about changing your general strategy to fit the particular round uh, within that context. Cool. A uh, couple of things there then are left to talk about within tactics. 
First is you cannot directly target all of the three, three teams at once with your tactics because there's a mutual exclusivity to your approaches, right? So if you realize that one team uh, can be beaten by focusing on weighing and another can be beaten by focusing on, on mechanization and then another team can be beaten by focusing on framing, you can't focus on all three of those things at once. Um, so that's why you have strategy because if there's any similarities between those teams and how they function, that should be captured within your strategy because they're about the teams that are in the same bracket or competition as you and how you would beat them. But if you, to the extent that you still want to do some tactics, it involves assessing the threat level, as a Matt Cato term, um, well, he, he didn't invent it, but he uses it a lot, uh, of each of the teams in the room, uh, in what position they are and in what motion, and what points you need or want from that round. So, um, depending, so for example, if you want to come first in a particular round, if you need or want three points, um, Think, okay, well, which team is in which position? Well, maybe this team is really, really strong when they're in uh, opening opposition and they're in opening opposition now. Um, and the motion is about economics and they're really good at economics, this team. Um, and, you know, that kind of stuff. Or maybe they're doing really well at this particular competition. They seem like they're really on fire. Um, well, if you want to come first in the round, we want to focus on them. Or alternatively, uh, if you're like, if, you, if the same situation is the case, but you only, only need to take a second, um, you might think, well, okay, they're probably going to boss this room. Um, we'll focus on beating the other two teams. And we'll have a, few, a little bit of weighing against them to deal with them later. Well, let's focus on, say, the next team down. So the next best team in the room. We'll try to focus on beating them and coming up with a strategy to beat them, hoping, therefore, that the other team in the room, the, the, the worst team in the room, in theory, based off the round motion, etc., cetera, um, that you'll be able to beat them anyway based off the quality of your team, right? Because ultimately, you still have to do debating. Um, you still have to do the actual arguments. Uh, run them well, argue them well, be creative, etc. Um, but this is how you maximize the chances of that quality that you have reaching its full effect in the room. Okay. Last thing I want to talk about is uh, time efficiency. So one of the element of tactics that's important is being efficient in the time that you're using within the debate because the um, restriction, the limitation on each team is that there is 14 minutes that you get to argue. Um, well, 14 minutes and 30 seconds, um, which means a few things. Firstly, that principles are actually quite high risk. Uh, they're often as very um, situational because they don't explain why you get the valuable thing. They're just explaining which things are valuable. So they're oftentimes only effective um, if it is absolutely true or really easy to prove that it's true that you get the thing that it's talking about, right? So an emotion about, I don't know, CCTV, uh, having more CCTV cameras, uh, it can be really useful to win a privacy principle there because it's really easy to prove that that violates privacy if you prove that privacy is important. But in a more general motion, like an economics motion, um, if you wanted to run something to do with the right to home ownership, um, that would be really context dependent. Because if you spend four minutes arguing that this gets people, or this is, that home ownership is a principled right, people should be able to be, to, to own a home, um, a team might very well beat you because you only have then within your speech three minutes to argue that you do in fact get people into homes. And that's probably the kind of thing that people are going to be arguing anyway. So unless it's really straightforward to prove that you get people into homes, it's often just better to argue in general. So the extent to which a principle is valuable in a round is relative to the, um, the degree to which that facilitates you achieving the end of your goal. So that means if there is a particular state of the world that is principally valuable or principally bad, um, based off your arguments, it is explaining how you achieve the end of getting to that point in the debate and whether the principle itself makes it easier for you to win the debate than it would be otherwise, right? So basically, is it making it, uh, are you wasting time, basically? Is the, is the four minutes you have to spend on writing this principle worth the expense of the four minutes that you would prove that you were getting to a certain end in the debate, whether that's getting people in jobs, getting people in houses, getting people employed, yada, yada, yada. Um, and oftentimes it is, but it's something you need to be really critical of um, because oftentimes I think people oftentimes run principles sometimes for the sake of them um, rather than based strategically off of what is effective in the round. That's just a side note. Uh, secondly, it means you should focus your proof on things that are likely to be contested in the round rather than a general approach. So when you're arguing, you're writing your case, think which of these things is going to be rebutted and put in your effort there rather than um, 
filling in blanks in on important spaces. Um, similarly, then it also means you need to continuously update how the debate is going. Um, you know, realizing when your analysis is sufficient, not running too much redundant redundant analysis. It's fine to have some redundancy on important points because you don't know whether that third point of rebuttal the judge really bought. So maybe you might want to have that fourth. Um, but in general, it means, you know, say you're in opening opposition and opening government have totally fucked it, which happens sometimes. You might want to think, okay, well, I'm going to give a couple of pieces of rebuttal to them to make sure they've beaten them, but I'm then going to move on to expanding my arguments, uh, weighing them really heavily so that we can beat the other teams in back half. Uh, contrastingly, if you're in a round and opening government have really nailed it, um, you might think, oh shit, okay, well, I'm going to need to rebut the shit out of them. Um, in my deputy speech for five minutes and then focus two minutes on weighing the top half clash as being really important so that we can get a first or a second uh, by like tying ourselves to the opening government case by saying, well, the clash that we're doing is the really important one, guys, uh, so we're going to win the debate or we're going to come second. But it's about continuously updating um, the the odds of the debate, basically. How, what's the win percentage of each, each team looking like as the round is progressing after each line of analysis that you say, etc. cetera. Uh, one extraneous thing, is that um, there's also like a bunch of other things that can vote that are involved in tactics because um, they're at the approach to analysis, right? So like, okay, well, which burdens um, are common across a lot of different arguments in the round and let's focus on arguing for them, uh, which arguments weigh very well in the round, um, you know, which things can we prove are very important, which things are the most asymmetric, right? Which things are the easiest, easiest to prove the change a lot so you can watch the other things. Um, those are all important elements of tactics, but I think they're covered in other workshops and are more like general, right? They're the kind of skills you work on in debating, you know, through just regular feedback and training. So I'm not going to focus on it too much. This is more the kind of um, strategic element of things to do with interactions between teams and the interactions between you and the circuit, uh, rather than like tactics about particular motions and arguments within those motions, if you get what I mean. Um, so I'm not going to spend so, so much time on that, um, but it is important, so it's worth mentioning it. So one thing I want to talk about now, now let's be the last thing, is um, tactics in an actual round and how it played out. Um, so I have written there as well. I, I know this might seem arrogant because, of course, me and Jack won this round. Um, but I think after I worked through it, I think it'll actually be clear that the point of this is that we were in some ways quite fortunate to be in the position and motion that we were in. Um, because all four teams were, in my opinion, working very strate strategically within that round. Um, and so I just get, I guess I just hope, I hope it doesn't ever come across arrogant. This is a motion I know a lot about because I was in it. And I thought about it a lot. Um, and I think it's a very interesting case study of tactics. Um, as a caveat, um, this is my understanding of the round and how it played out. I obviously don't know specifically why each team made the choices that they did. Um, and maybe I'm picking up on things that weren't there. Uh, but in my opinion, this seems to be what's the case. Uh, as a recap, uh, the motion was, this has hopes that extraterrestrial life exists. Uh, opening government, which is Edinburgh, uh, Jamie and Karras, said this ushers in a new era of enlightenment. Uh, OO was us. We said life is utility negative, so more life equals more bad. Uh, CG, which is Sophia A, Ruben and Nikki, said life is utility positive, so more life is more good. And CO was um, LSE, Matt and Ahmed, who said that this destabilizes humanity leading to a bunch of different arms. So let's walk through the tactics of this motion. So, OG, uh, Edinburgh's strengths and qualities, sorry, their strengths were like quality analysis and plausible analysis. They would run really, really like reasonable, well-proven cases that did a lot of really good work in the round. Like they were really, really good team. Particularly Karras, I thought was excellent around that time, was probably one of the best deputies in the world. Uh, and Jamie was really good, particularly I thought was really good PM very good at setting up debates. Um, so they knew a few things though. So they knew that we were not very predictable in OO. So they needed to develop a strategy that could work regardless of what we ran in OO, because they wouldn't have been able to predict what we were gonna what we were gonna run. Secondly, that their closing, Sophia A, were really prone to reframing and outframing people in debates. A CEO, LSEA, were prone to covering a lot of bases and running a lot of analysis in debates. And that they were in opening government. So their ability to engage with the rest of the debate was really limited. As a result of this, the optimal strategy in OG in that round was to, was to run a general case. So um, proving that proposing the motion 
brings in something new, which insulates us against harms and increases our capacity to solve problems, get good things, and has independent benefits, right? So I always often think of these as like um, catalyst cases, right? So like, like, a, you know, like a catalyst speeds up uh, a reaction. It's basically, uh, and they're very strong arguments these in open government in general, um, things which catalyze effects happening in the debate to maximize good things happening and minimize bad things happening. In their case, fill, fit this brief very well. So their case was, well, they had a lot of different things, but the kind of underpinning of it and what it becomes when it's kind of fully developed in Keres' speech is that this will usher in a new era of enlightenment and that new era of enlightenment will help us solve a bunch of different problems, um, will bring in a bunch of different good things and will prevent bad things from happening. Um, and the reason this is really good is because it's very difficult to reframe this because um, like no matter what frame you're operating under in CG, so if they say if CG reframed it to be a climate change debate, um, oh, oh, OG already had material that would explain why they could solve climate change better. Um, so they're covering that ground by having analysis that's cross applicable to a lot of different grounds. Um, in CO, it works well because even if CO run a bunch of different material, the idea would be that this would help prevent the bad things that they want to talk about from happening to the extent that they might exist anyways. And it means that probably, regardless of what we run in OO, if we bring up a potential harm, we'll fix, they'll fix that harm through this new era of enlightenment. So there's a really strategic case here in open government. In OO, um, our strengths at the time were, um, broadly speaking, running principles, we were pretty decent at, and kind of unconventional or unpredictable analysis. We tended to do better based off kind of, um, you know, hitting people where they didn't expect it. Uh, and we know that OG will prove a very like, well-proven, strong and reasonable case reasonable in the sense of like it, it will sound to the judges like oh yeah obviously that's true which is a really important skill uh, cg are prone to reframing and co will out analyze us on almost anything right they'll analytically extend on almost anything we run so we needed a case that a frame the debate really strongly to prevent cg from reframing but also to evade oh i said oh oh there i meant to say og evading og's arguments so try to like sidestep open government not get locked into a battle with them and then beaten by a back half team secondly reframing reframing it into analysis that suited our strengths so that CO couldn't analytically extend. Um, so we need to reframe it into something like principles. And thirdly, that could be weighed really extensively um, because otherwise the other three teams would make us relevant, right? It, it's always in the incentive of the, other, of the other three teams in that debate if we do something outside the box um, to just throw it away unless we make them accept it. Um, so because of that, we chose to run Life is Bad, which let us run a principle meaning that it's going to be tougher for CO to extend because they're going to be able to analyze us on most things, but maybe not principles. Um, and it meant that it kind of outframed on scale uh, the rest of the debate, right? So that was the idea behind that case. But here's where things I think get more interesting is the next four things that happen. First is Keras' speech. Uh, so Keras, um, I presume, again, I don't know, um, realizes there's no point in engaging with our case directly because we have 14 minutes of time to dedicate to proving our case is true. And they have at best seven minutes. And even if they can take us that right, so even if Keras could have spent five minutes rebutting this and totally knocked us out of the debate, that means that OG would likely lose to a back half team who didn't have to spend that five minutes doing it because opening government had already done it. Um, so it wouldn't make sense to do that. The best strategy then was to expand and weigh the existing material, which did really well, uh, with a view that either A, we'd be discarded by being off cash or irrelevant, which is really plausible that that would happen, or B, that the back half teams would do the work for opening government, right? So the open CG or, o or CO would spend their time making us look implausible or irrelevant, and then lose to opening government who hadn't wasted their time doing that and had instead spent time impacting, extending, and weighing their arguments. So that was the good strategy that I thought happened there. Then the responsive strategy or the, I, I keep saying strategy, I mean tactics in this, in this uh, context. I realize, you know, there's no point engaging with OG very much because either by this point, the judges already buy our frame and think we're beating them um, or they don't and we're never going to beat them on responses, right? There's no point me spending three minutes um, doing rebuttal to how this works on earth because I'm never going to beat them up doing that. Uh, they're always going to have spent more time and done better analysis on the, on the ground earth impacts. So no point in me doing that. Um, I used to just kind of, you know, time I sailed to the mast, is that the phrase? Time I sailed to the mast um, and focus on our own case. So, and consequently, what I need to do now 
in terms of my objectives is extensively frame so that CO you can't reframe and extensively weigh so that CO can't outweigh by running a different case. So basically prove utilitarianism in more detail. Then CG, uh, which is Sophia, their strength is in framing and in running grounded, like um, realistic analysis. I think they're very good at doing that. Also, as a side note, I know they came up with this uh, case in prep, broadly speaking, um, rather than like in response to the debate with that was happening. That doesn't really matter because a lot of this tactic strategy happens like when people are forecasting the debate in prep time, right? Um, so it's in their incentive to accept our frame because um, it'll instantly beat OG, right? Um, because if if CG and OO agree on on the framing, um, OG is often going to be in a pretty difficult scenario um, because you know, they don't get a chance to respond to either of those teams really. And it means that that's not going to become a big clash on the diagonal. Um, and it also makes sense to adopt our framing because they have a comparative advantage. They've got positional advantage over us, right? Because they've got way more time to respond to us than we have to respond to them. The reason it would be a bad idea for them to reject our frame to argue the on earth stuff is that they'd have far less time to engage with the on earth stuff than OG and CO um, because they would have to respond to our framing. Um, and not spend time arguing the stuff. Um, so they run the risk, the risk of coming third by beating us and coming and putting us in the fourth place uh, with OG and CO fighting for the win, which is why Keras' strategy earlier was good to kind of pass the hot potato down to closing government. Um, they also likely know that CO will not accept that framing of O and CG. Um, so they avoid a bloodbath by you know, arguing the honor stuff, having to respond directly to CO and OO, who are running entirely different cases um like and also weighing their analysis against uh, against og that would just put so much work on on their plate that it makes no sense for them to do that it was also a good idea to, to focus on accepting mostly the premise of happiness being important and focus on whether most people are happy or not happy because that shifts the uh, focus of the analysis towards their strengths and away from ours so we would have been better at arguing the philosophical stuff um of like well what is the morally good world Whereas they were much better at, uh, in theory at arguing the on the ground stuff of like, well, psychologically, are people happy? How do people interact with um, phenomena, information, the world, etc.? So it shifts the, the focus of the, of, the, of the clash towards their strengths and away from our strengths. CEO then, their strength is analytically covering a lot of ground. Uh, they're in a really tough position by this point, right? Because all the strategy that everyone else has done in the debate has been to an extent to fuck with them. Um, because every team is trying to fuck the team that comes after them. Um, and so if the, if three teams have already spoken, CO have been fucked with three, three times. Um, so if they accept our frame and CG's frame, um, it gives themselves way too much to do. They not e only need to justify some of the elements in the frame, because CG cleverly don't agree with us entirely on happiness being the metric, because they have some stuff to do with consent um, uh, and uh, like um, veil, of, veil of ignorance stuff. Um, so they have to they couldn't just accept the frame and be done with it because they still need to justify it by arguing against CG on it. Uh, and they'd also need to provide better reasons for us than uh, for for the point of like being utility negative um, and weigh these as being better on a kind of a ground that they're less comfortable doing, right? Because we've shifted the folks in the off-bench in that context, if that happened, towards our advantage. So it made far more sense to accept OG's frame for similar, similar reasons to CG, right? They have positional advantage over OG. They have way more time to respond to OG. And OG have way less time to respond to them. Uh, and any response that they give to CG now also functions as weighing against us. Because any time that Ahmed, for example, says that the outside of Earth impacts are speculative, um, that's rebutting CG and weighing against us at the same time. Because it's explaining a speculativeness to the short diagonal frame um, that, I guess, means it's a really efficient way of delivering analysis then. So that's why it made sense for them to take the approach that they did. And also in their arguments about destabilization, etc., cetera, uh, worked well with the kind of analysis that they were good at doing at the time. They explained a load of different ways in which this would interact badly, adding that level of depth that you'd expect them to give uh, for those kinds of cases. And there's also some really smart stuff that happens in both the web speeches. I think Nikki's um, like reframe of um, what speculativeness means in the context of the debate is really clever. And Ahmed has some really good responses to that as well, and some really clever responses to OG too. Um, but that's kind of the idea of all the tactics of the round. One final thing I want to know about this round, which I think is really good, uh, is I think the best POI I've ever heard uh, is the one that OG delivers to CO in that debate. So 
Um, OG say, most people don't want to be entirely depressed, so they are thus likely to be, to be more open to ideas that allow them to rationalize their own existence positively, which is why people were open to like progress in the space race, despite the fact that we were in the middle of a Cold War. I hope by now it should be clear what this POI is doing in the debate. And I think it also partially evidences um, my understanding of, of what strategy was happening in the debate. Uh, but to summarize, it does a couple of things here. Firstly, it refutes CO's core contention uh, by doing the stuff that we said earlier worked well against LSEA, right? Sociological uh, kind of less um, rational analysis uh, where it's like, okay, well, people have this kind of sensibility. That means they react to information in this kind of way. Um, trying to neutralize all of CO's claims, which might be related to a particular underlying premise of people wanting to interact negatively with information. Um, secondly, it makes it makes explicit their implicit material about how living creatures interact with their environment in such a way as to rebut our claims in opening opposition. Because if this is entirely true, then our claims aren't true. Because even if there is negativity, people don't focus on it. And it also means that CG's claims where CG have explicitly said something similar, similar to this, it implies that they're partially derivative. It implies that the stuff that, is, that they're saying can also be taken out of the OG case in the implicit ways that it's presented with an opening government. Ultimately, the PI didn't win them the debate, but it just goes to show the level of strategy that OG were operating on that debate, and all four teams in it as well, where I think that there's, like, I think this POI really clearly highlights the kind of chess game that was happening uh, with four teams in the debate. I guess I don't, I don't play chess, but I'd imagine this is pretty similar to what it's like. Cool. Uh, the reason then that we won the debate, uh, as it should be clear now, isn't that we were necessarily the best team, uh, but that there was a tactic that we were able to employ within our general strategy that suited the most. So obviously, all four teams here were operating within the general strategy that they isolated before the tournament um, and had modulated it slightly in the ways that I outlined there to deal with the, the motion at hand, how different teams were interacting with it over the course of the round, updating constantly. It's very probable that a different motion could have yielded a different result for each team. So the same final motion about cryptocurrency uh, would have beaten or it would have suited Edinburgh very well because they beat us in the semi-final. Uh, we came second, uh, they came first, we both we both advanced. Uh, the round nine motion, for example, about breaking up um, the ABCDs, the really big company, uh, the seeds company, uh, probably would have suited LSE very well. Um, that's the kind of thing where race to the median becomes a really strong argument and they argue for that really, really well uh, oftentimes. Although I think they actually lose to, and they actually lost to Tel Aviv in that round. But if you get what I mean, right, like that kind of motion would have worked well. Uh, and the round five motion about IR probably would have suited Sophia really well, for example. Um, maybe not those specific motions, but if you get what I mean, it's like the, the motion and the positions and all those kinds of things play so much into the tactics that you're employing in a particular round. Um, and the really important thing then is to think about, um, think critically about these things uh, as opposed to identifying them as an afterthought or as a kind of a secondary thing. Uh, because you know, in this motion, for example, so much of the team's cases were informed by the strategy and the tactics that they were employing within the round. And it's a really effective way of going about doing debates. Because what it means is, if you're thinking about this kind of thing, um, you're going to beat teams that are better than you, um, better in inverted commas, um, if they're not doing it. Uh, and similarly, if teams are worse than you, but are doing this stuff, they're going to beat you. Um, so that's basically, I think, all that I had to say um, about tactics and stuff in debates. Um, but in brief, basically, it's just that there is certain modes of operating within debates that are strategically and tactically effective to do as worth critically thinking about them a little bit. I hope that was helpful for people here. Um, I do intend to do a few more of these if people enjoyed it. Um, I'm not sure if maybe this was uh, stuff that was obvious to people or whether it wasn't, uh, but I do want to do more of this kind of thing. So. Um, I guess let me know if you found this uh, valuable or enjoyable or anything like that. But yeah, um, uh, that's all I have.